Happy Sabbath, everyone. Good to see everyone out um, this brisk fall morning and Sabbath, and we are happy to be here together again. Um, I wanted to mention a couple things before we start. One of them is that this month of October has some um, some interesting um, days. October twenty uh, second, many of you will know, was the one hundred eightieth anniversary of what we as Adventists often call the Great Disappointment. Um, 180 years. Um, So I challenge you um, to take some time this weekend and actually look at what that means and what came out of it. Uh, To me, it wasn't really a disappointment. It was a purification, although it was obviously very disappointing for those that were there. Uh, Pastor Adam Ramden, one of my friends, he's a pastor in the North England Conference in the United Kingdom, has a program called Legacy. Um, There's a five-minute video, maybe I'll share it with Scott or Alex and we can send it around, that really does a nice little five-minute summation. He actually comes to New England to film in some of the historical Adventist sites here. Really good to just keep that in perspective. I I mention that because we don't have forever. Um, And that 180-year mark to me is very significant. The other thing I want to mention in October is the 31st of October is off, has been hijacked. And most people think of October 31st, and they think of Halloween. And of course, Halloween is naturally um, embedded with um, occult and scary symbolism. Um, You know, if you drive around, it seems like every year the lawn fixtures get more frightening. I drove by one, and it was like a a clown jester coming out of a a, a, a box on the side. I said, man, if I was in the middle of the night and I was running and I saw this thing, I'd be afraid. Um, so, you know, it gets more frightening. But what October 31st actually represents is the anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. That is the day when Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses to the church in Germany. And so I don't want you to lose sight of these things. The devil is going to do a very good job of trying to cover over these things so we don't think about eternal things. Um, and I just want to highlight that before we get into our message. also want to mention that since we've been talking about prayer meeting from the pulpit, we have had awesome turnouts. Um, used to be two families that showed up. I <laughs> uh, won't say which two, uh, but most of you probably know. But it has been great to see so many of you guys coming to prayer meeting Um, I think those of you who come see why it's such a blessing and and a benefit. And I want to challenge you still, even if it's one Wednesday night a month, come to prayer meeting, come and tell us what God has done for you and lay before the throne of God, your petitions, not even just for yourself, but for those people in your life, you want to see God move on their behalf. Where two or three are gathered together, Christ is there am I in the midst of them. And when we touch and agree, two or three of us, there's power in that. And so I want to challenge you again uh, to come out to prayer meeting. Now, let's get into our message for today. Um, uh, we're going to go to part five of our creation versus evolution series. Our scripture reading starts at Genesis chapter six. I'm going to read verses seven and eight. Um, Genesis six, seven and eight. The Bible says, and the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created From the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Verse 8 is what was read earlier, and it says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Our message this Sabbath is entitled, The Gospel and the flood, the gospel and the flood, creation versus evolution, part five, our final, our final installation. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word. And I ask in a special way now, Lord, that you just make me a nail on the wall, hammer that nail in with your Holy Spirit, and then Lord, hang a portrait of Jesus Christ. There's no reason for me to be seen or heard, Lord. We need a word from you. And when we deal with these challenging discussions Uh, that the world really tries to to distort. I am praying now, Lord, that you pour out your Holy Spirit in double and triple portion and do as you said the Holy Spirit would do, that he would lead us into all truth. 
This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to go to Genesis chapter 6. Um, we've been talking about creation, and the, the story of the flood is always tied to creation because it was and, and remains maybe the most significant event to affect the earth physically since the earth was created. It is a great point of contention because obviously the more evidence there is for a global flood, the more support there is for the belief in the Bible as it is written. So you have to understand that just bringing up this topic means that the enemies of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the enemies of the church, the enemies of the word, all align to come against it. You cannot study this topic and not understand that by default, you enter the realm of spiritual warfare. Because the devil does not want you to see from the story what God has for us. And one of the things that he has for us is to show us that God is a merciful and long-suffering, patient God. So let's read. I'm going to read chapter 6 almost all the way through. Um, and then we're going to go into some of the, some of the um, questions that we need to answer for today. Genesis 6 and verse 1 says this. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them. And I'm going to explain what this means here in a second. That the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they chose. Verse 3, and the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years. So let me, let me sum this up because a lot of people miss this. They think, and what people think is that there are um, 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 Nephilim and these giants that we're going to talk about here in a second. And they think that those are angels from heaven. That's not what's happening. In fact, the word race in the Bible is not often associated with race as we as Americans understand it. We think of race and we think about how people look different. When God speaks of race in Genesis, especially in this story, he speaks of men's characters. Uh, don't miss this. There were two races of men on the earth, and one of them were the descendants of Cain, one the descendants of Seth. The descendants of Cain had gone away from God. The descendants of, of Seth are called the sons of God. And once you understand that, you understand a lot of what's in the spirit of prophecy that's misconstrued, but also you understand this story a whole lot better. So when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, the sons of God. So which men were, began to multiply? These are the descendants of Cain who were in constant rebellion against God. When those men began to multiply on the face of the earth, because remember Cain had been sent away, um, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God. And the spirit of prophecy tells us that the sons of God stayed in the higher places of earth um, and they came down and they saw the daughters. What did they see about these women? They were beautiful. They looked good. And when they saw them, they took them wives, all whom they chose. This was a violation of God's instruction. They were not supposed to mix with those folk who had not surrendered their lives to God. I hope you're getting this. There's modern day application to this as well. Somebody ought to say amen. Verse 3, and the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also flesh. And God realized when they violated the, the rule that they were supposed to not be unequally yoked with non-believers, when God saw that, he said, my spirit shall not always strive with man. This statement actually applies to us today. God's spirit will be withdrawn from this planet. And when his spirit was withdrawn from the planet the first time, catastrophe happened. When it's withdrawn from the earth the second time, catastrophe will again happen. Yet his days shall be 120 years. So he gave man a probationary period of 120 years. Now, verse 4. Here's where it gets interesting. A lot of people mix this up. It says there, are, there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, and it says, uh, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. When these two groups began to come together and have children, their children, they say, were giants. And this does not simply mean giants in stature. And I wish I had time, I would actually show you that there is fossil evidence of larger human beings than we have on earth today. Um, but these were men of renown. They were wise. There was, a, there was something that happened when they came together. 
But out of that wisdom, and I should say knowledge really, verse 5 says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The rebellion of Cain, through his descendants now, infected the world, and evil took over. It got, it got so bad that when God saw his wickedness, God said that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Verse 6, and it repented the Lord. God regretted that he had made man on the earth. And look at what it says about God. And it grieved him at his heart. Here, you have to understand each of these verses to get the story right. What is it that really grieved God about the situation on earth? It was that man's wickedness caused man to live in a condition and situation that was never intended. What do I mean? Man became mean, violent, unkind. They conquered. They took. They stole. Adultery became rampant. Uh, and, and in this process, the scripture tells us um, that it grieved God in his heart. Why? Because the way God designed the earth to be, we would have lived a peaceful situation in harmony and love with one another and with our God. It'd be like you having a whole, uh, you having a pet and, and you design your yard and everything for your pets to have a wonderful experience and all they do is fight and tear each other apart. God looked, and the Bible says it grieved him at his heart. Verse 7, because a lot of people think, well, how could God be so cruel to do this? Follow this. Verse 7, and the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repents me that I have made them. God looked at it, and, and he couldn't stand it. Now, again, when he looked at the situation, what God saw wasn't simply that there were all these people alive. He saw that the condition that they were living in was suboptimal. He saw that they were living a terrible existence. He saw that what he had created them to be and to do all over earth had been spoiled, contaminated. And God said it would be better to start over. Now watch this. Because verse 8 is important. It says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Embedded in the story of the flood and Noah's flood and the ark is this statement, a statement of grace. What does grace mean? It means unmerited, undeserved favor. No matter how good Noah was, when God saw him, Noah's intention was read and God said, this man is different from all the others. He wants to serve me. He wants to love me. God saw Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And in finding this grace, the story changes. It isn't now a story about the destruction of the earth. It is a story about the preservation of the line of those who will serve God. Now, look at verse 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. What does it mean to be just? The Bible says, the just shall live by Faith. Noah was a man of faith is what it's really saying. And he was perfect in his generations. And look at the last part there. And Noah did what? He walked with God. God appeared to Noah. We're told in the spirit of prophecy, an angel appears and gives him the warning of what is to happen. God speaks to Noah, tells him there would only be 120 days and begins, begins to give him instruction. The Bible then says that Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And then it says in verse 11, and the, the earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with what? Violence. And here is where the, it, the rub is. God says, listen, the earth is so filled with violence, something has to happen, and this righteous man Noah will be my instrument. Now, let me show you, because we're going to make parallels to the end time, but while we're on the topic of violence, the, which is the Hebrew word Hamas, here it is. Look at this. This is the number of mass shootings in the United States between 1980, 1982 and September 2024. Something in the world is changing. I want to make you see that you, we are living in a time when we need to really be thinking about our relationship with God. This is the number of mass shootings. Now, this year, it's lower. I honestly think that when you look at election years, it almost seems like it drops for whatever reason. Um, this year is not over yet, but you can see 
there's a trend of more and more mass shootings. Isn't that interesting? I say this all the time. I find it fascinating. You get a new job, and one of the trainings for a new employee is um, 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 mass shooting uh, preparedness or um, active shooter. That's the word they use. Active shooter training. That, that's crazy. That you would live in a world where part, you're not going to learn where your desk is and how to log on to the computer. you got to know where to hide if somebody comes and starts shooting. But it's not just that. That's one small piece of the violence in the world. This is armed conflict. And just yesterday, um, the nation of Israel, the modern nation of Israel, actually did begin military strikes on the nation of Iran. I don't know if you guys are aware of this. So there's an escalation in the Middle East. Again, violence. When you look at what's happening, and you could take sides any way you want in the war in Europe, you could take sides any way you want the war in the Middle East. It's not just Europe and the Middle East, as you can see here. There are armed conflicts all over the world. Each of these things mean something different. Some of them are internal conflicts. But the world is a violent place. So violent that many of you make sure at night you lock your door. Most of us have not just locks on our doors. We have alarm systems. Some of us have locks, alarms, and cameras. Some of you got locks, alarms, cameras, and baseball bats. <laughs> and some of you probably even have more than that, but I'm not going to say. Right? So here it is that the world is in a violent state again. Now, we live in a relatively safe place, but there are parts of the world where literally going outside of your house, you take your life into your hands. I mean, not that you don't hear, because you do, clearly, by the mass shooting graph, but you get my point. This is gang violence in the world, and you can see all over the world in many different types of countries. Now, it's funny, America doesn't show up on here, but the truth of the matter is, I worked with the gangs in Los Angeles, and there is gang warfare in the streets of America, just like everywhere else, in every major city in the United States. I'm not sure why America didn't light up on here, because we have a gang warfare problem as well. But you can see all over the world, gang violence is an issue. And it's not just that. It's not just that the world is violent. It's that violence is often glorified, glamorized. This is an article um, from Nick's, I think it was called Nick's, um, uh, an online magazine, Hollywood glorifies serial killers. And listen to what they say. I'm going to talk about how violent the world is today. This is from last year. Hollywood has been making a killing from TV shows and movies about serial killers. They continue to make a profit from these shows by casting attractive actors to play horrible people. Making these shows without regard to the pain that they are causing to the families of victims or the damage that they are causing to young viewers by glamorizing these killers. And ironically, although Hollywood more politically leans left and would be theoretically more against guns, it's Hollywood that has really um, 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 made, made America into a gun culture from an entertainment standpoint. How many movies end, and they end with everybody shot up and everybody dead? I think back to when I used to watch movies like Rambo and Commando and them kind of movies. I mean, and if you go back to the Westerns, it, it, there's a glorifying of violence. And what I, I, I say all of that while we pause on this section of Genesis chapter 6 to make you realize God cannot stand that the world is in this condition. He couldn't stand it in Noah's day. He cannot stand it today. Verse 12, And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. This is what's important. Again, when God says, for the earth is filled with violence through them, he's saying they are going to destroy themselves. I hope you get this. God actually is stepping in to start the world over because man would have destroyed himself. Let me tell you the kind of the proof in the pudding. The proof in the pudding is, even to this day, the nuclear arsenal that the world has could destroy the planet probably dozens, if not hundreds of times over. And if you think about what would happen if Earth just went on and there was no promise of a second coming, I would have to believe eventually somebody would use those nuclear weapons. I'm sorry. 
Because I can tell you, no one would have thought in 1924 that by 1940, you would have um, what happened to the Jews in Europe. Right? You would have never thought that something like that could happen. There were pogroms. There were things that happened in Europe against Jews, even here in the United States. But you would have never thought that the final solution would come to play and that they would try to ex literally try and wipe the entire Jewish population off of the face of the earth. I want to submit to you that man, and the scripture says the heart of man is wicked, dark, and evil. If man existed long enough, man would destroy himself. In fact, he is slowly destroying himself if you really look at what's going on. So God says, I will destroy them from the earth. And the reason I'm taking my time to lay this out is because God is the one that is always blamed, as I'm going to show you later on, for what happened. But we have to understand that God is the greatest of knowers. He understands better than we do. He steps in to try and rectify the situation because man cannot be trusted with man. Verse 14. Make thee, so he gives Noah instruction, make thee an, uh, an ark of gopher wood, excellent wood for buoyancy and for sealing and other things, just perfect wood to pick. Room, uh, room shalt thou make in the ark and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch to seal it so it doesn't get, take water in. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make it of. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits and the height of it 30 cubits. A window shalt thou make to the ark, and, a, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above, and the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof, with lower second and third stories shalt thou make it. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. So the two things here, one, amazing description of building the ark. And I'm gonna we'll talk more about that in a second. But the other part of it is that it was going to be a flood. Now you remember, if you go back in Genesis, at this point, there was no rain. The Bible says that a mist of water came up from below. It speaks that there was a layer of water around the earth. We talked about that before. Um, and so they, didn't, they had never seen rain before, which is part of the reason Noah's pitch to them was so difficult. Because he was saying, there's going to be a flood. It's going to rain. You better get ready. And they said, what is rain? This man is crazy. Verse 18, but thee, Noah, will I establish, but with thee, Noah, I will establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives, and every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort, shall I bring to the ark to keep them alive with thee. They, they, shall, uh, they shall be male and female. Now, some, then the next question, and I'm just trying to answer these as we read through, how would all of the animals have fit on the ark? That's what people say. There's no possible way. But it's actually very possible, because if you study genetics, it, all you would have needed for all of the 300 some odd 60 species of dogs, all you would have needed to put on the ark are two wolves. And they would differentiate afterwards into all the species of dogs. Did you know that? And almost every category of animal, you would only have needed two, and they would split and spread into everything else. The other thing is, you didn't have to put a full-grown giraffe in the ark, right? You could have put two smaller giraffes in. And we'll talk more about that in a second. Um, but he brings them in male and female. A fowls after their kind, cattle after their kind, creeping things of the, after their kind. Two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive. And you have to take the food, Noah, for them to eat. And you shall gather it to thee, and it shall be food for thee and for them. So then he has to, he has to, you know, they didn't have Costco back then. So Noah had to have a plan, 120 years of farming. He had to figure out how to make food that would last. I, I mean, the, what this, the ask of Noah is incredible. He's got to be carpenter, farmer. He's got to be, he got, you know, he's got to preserve stuff. I mean, it's, it's a serious job. Remember, there's no refrigerators. Serious job Noah's given. This is why it took such a special person to do it. Because let me tell you something, to be faithful to this calling for 120 years took an extreme amount of faith. The secret to being a Christian isn't that you can run the sprint and give your heart to God when you feel emotionally like you should. It is enduring through the years and decades of your life when you feel you should walk away from God. It is staying there, doing what God has called you to do, 
even when it is no longer popular or pleasant. Noah did that. And the Bible says in Genesis 6 and verse 22, thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. He had some help. There were others who helped him along the way. Enoch, the Bible says, um, Enoch walked with God and then he was not. We we're told that Enoch helped. You know, he, he was trying to convince. There were others that tried to help and died before the, the, the flood. There are others that helped. And when the ridicule came, as we're going to talk about, they gave up and said, you know what, forget this. I'm, <laughs> I'm going back to join the crowd of, of those who ridicule. So he didn't, it wasn't that he didn't have help, but he was the consistent one. And here's the thing for us as men and fathers. He was the example for his family. Noah stayed true to the plow and his sons followed him into the ark. Here's what Hebrews 11 verse 7 says. By faith, Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house by the which he condemned the world and became ear of the righteousness, which is by what? By faith. Huh. Noah wasn't saved because he built the ark. He built the ark because he was saved. It was righteousness by faith. So some people try and separate righteousness from, by faith and obedience. You can't. Because once you understand who God is and what he requires of you, by faith you will do what God says do. Not by your own strength. Noah couldn't have done this for 120 years. It was because Noah, the Bible tells us that his secret, Noah walked with God. So watch this. Questions for today. Number one, is there any evidence today of a global flood? Is there any evidence? And I could do a whole series on just that, so we're just going to do some high-end stuff. Second question, would an ark built to the specifications of the book of Genesis narrative have worked? Would it really have done what it would have needed to do in this story? And third, what are the present-day spiritual implications of the story of the flood? Because that's really the most important part. Why does the world want to tear apart this story? Why are you seen as, as crazy if you believe this story? Satan does not want you to believe this story. He wants you to think it's just some made-up myth in fact, what they say is the, 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 the Babylonian, there are two floods from Babylon and some other place, and there's stories about them, and they say, nah, it's not really this story. Moses made it up from that story. Nah. The opposite is absolutely true, and we'll come back to that. So I wanted to show you this. This is a series on Netflix that I, I, I don't rec necessarily recommend you watch it, except to say this. This has gotten a lot of heat and a lot of backlash from archaeologists, even some theologians. I've, been, I've, I've watched the series. I was going back through it. Basically, this man here, Graham Hancock, is actually not a Christian. I don't even think he believes in God at all. But he has this burning belief that before the Ice Age, there was an intelligent civilization, and that then there was a global catastrophe, and somehow the knowledge from the civilization before the Ice Age transmitted around the world, which is why there are pyramids around the world, similar stories around the world. Now, people have, this guy is being thoroughly attacked. And you know why? Because what the research he's doing supports 100% the biblical narrative. Now, he, now, here's the funny thing. He doesn't like the Bible. You can tell he doesn't like the Bible. When he mentions all the flood stories from all over the world, he gives the least amount of time to the story of Noah. He shows it for a second and he moves on. But by default, what he is saying lines up perfectly with Scripture. There was a very intelligent, advanced civilization before the previous Ice Age, quote unquote. There was a, a, a one, and it was the antediluvian world that we just read about that became so wicked. They were wise, men of renown. And somehow that information transmitted past what he describes as this Global catastrophe, and so afterwards there were a group of people who spread this thing. And if you watch it, you see all of the satanic symbolism, all of the pagan symbolism that the Bible describes all throughout the thing. It's powerful. And I bring it up only to say the truth will come out. And you know what you know we're told? The rocks will cry out. And I want to submit to you that that's what's beginning to happen. As much as they want to deny the scripture, they want to deny that the Bible existed and the flood happened, 
The evidence just keeps pouring in that the Bible is right. So let me show you. These are some of the evidences that there was a global fund, flood. There's five things I'll mention here. There's a lot more, and I'm just going to, again, highlight this because I want to get to the spiritual ramifications. But number one, much of the surface of the earth is covered by rock strata that formed underwater. This is interesting because what we find is you have sandstone on top of mountains. Well, sandstone comes from sand, which comes from the ocean. How did it get to the top of a mountain? Some people say, well, it was the tectonic plates of the mountain shot up. But it doesn't make sense because buried in the sand are the fossils, marine fossils, as we'll talk about, which is number two, marine fossils high on mountains. I'll show you a picture of that. That, in fact, you'd have to explain away how it is that you have seashells on the top of very high mountains. Third, massive graveyards of fossils all over the world. The, the, the fossil record is not evidence of evolution. The fossil record is evidence of extinction. It is the exact opposite. And I'm going to show you by how rapidly these fossils were laid down that, in fact, only the biblical description of the flood actually makes all of that, make that all of what we find in the fossil record actually makes sense up to the very well-preserved fossils. And then we talked about the, the ark already. I'll show you a few slides on the design of the ark and how it is that if this is just a made-up story, how did some engineer design the thing? Down to the best type of wood and understanding to put pitch. One guy said, and I, I, I'll come back to it maybe, but one guy said, well, that doesn't make sense. If you look at how the ark was designed, how would it sail? How would it get around? It wasn't supposed to get around. It was just supposed to float so you didn't drown in the flood. It, this was in Carnival Cruise Line. It was an ark. So let me show you some of the things from these questions. Again, I'm not going to get too deep into this, except to say, how do you get these massive fossil graveyards? If there was no flood, how do you get it where all these animals wind up piled one on top of the other, dead and fossilized? And to fossilize, something has to, it has to not only die quickly, it has to be sealed so that the elements can't get to it so that it, um, so that it decays naturally. You don't find fossils of, of animals now, you know, when you dig six feet under, they, de they decay and they go away. The fossilization process happens because of the rapid laying down of the sediment and the dirt and so these graveyards tell you a whole lot of things died all at once and were sealed and preserved. And I'm going to show you that they, the preservation of them is actually astounding and probably one of, the, one of the biggest things that prove that what we're being told when I was in public school growing up and I was being told about um, evolution, it can't be true based on what the, what the science is pointing out. This one shows you that sediment layers spread across vast areas. Well, if there was no flood, how do you have a sedimentary layer this big? Right? The sedimentary rock layers expose the walls of the Grand Canyon, uh, belong to six uh, mega sequences that can be traced across North America. At the base of these layers are huge boulders and sand beds, again, from the ocean, that are evidences of sediments being laid down rapidly across the entire United States of America. How would that happen? And you can go to the, if you ever go to the Grand Canyon, the Grand Canyon is an awesome evidence that there had to be a flood. Because what they tell you when you go to the Grand Canyon is that this layer is how many millions of years old, and this layer is how many millions of years old, and this layer is how many millions of years old. So then how are the lines between them perfectly straight? Where are the trees that stick up between them? Where is the, 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 the rivers and valleys that should, from erosion? Only happens if they were all laid down rapidly at one time. They have rocks that bend at 90 degrees. I should have put that picture in, I don't think I did. Bend at 90 degrees only could have been happened if at some point that rock was liquid and then dried into place at the Grand Canyon. So, same here. This is um, the chalk beds of Southern England. If you ever go here, the, the, you've heard of the White Cliffs of Dover. That's, this is all chalk. Uh, and the Cretaceous chalk beds of Southern England are well known, um, as you, you, you've probably seen them. And these things actually come from um, the shells of marine animals that crush together to make this chalk. And this layer goes all the way across France, Netherlands, Germany, Poland, and southern Scandinavia. How would you get that kind of marine material in a layer across all that space if it wasn't laid there rapidly by a flood? I, I, I'm not here to prove to you the flood. I'm here to 
tell you, stop listening to what they say as if they've got it all right. So they ask a lot of questions about what we believe. Some of us have stopped asking them questions about what they believe. Right? Here's one. The sea creatures in high places. This is a fossil ammonite called marine uh, cephalopods. Like these one are found in limestone beds high in the Himalayas of Nepal. How did marine fossils get thousands of feet above sea level? Right? It had to be something catastrophic that happened globally. The rapidly fossilized, you see these? Many fish were buried and fossilized quickly, such as this fish caught in the act of eating its last meal. How, again, could it have just died slowly and then, it doesn't make sense. For you to get caught eating another fish and be fossilized means whatever killed you happened suddenly, abruptly, and then it sealed you off so that you could see both. This one is even more impressive. This one, this female, it's, uh, uh, ichthosaur, a marine reptile, was found fossilized at the moment of giving birth to her baby. How does this happen without a worldwide deluge? And they, they fight us on this, but there's a lot of things. Here's another one. Rapidly fossilized. If some fishes are buried so rapidly that fine details of fins and eye sockets have been preserved. We talked about the trilobite in a previous message has been so exclusively preserved that even the compound lens systems, remember I talked about how their eyesight was better than ours, even though they say we evolved from them. So we, if we evolved from them, we got the bad end of the deal because we got bad eyes and they've got good ones, right? Are still available. So you can see at the detail of their eyes. This can't happen unless there's a rapid catastrophic thing. And if, it just, if you just found these things in one part of the world, you go to Australia, you go to... Um, uh, 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 Europe, North America, Africa, you find these patterns globally. And, it, and all of them date back the same way. And I'm going to show you how we know they date back here. 85 reports of biological remnants and fossils. I won't get too much into this except to tell you, they have found blood vessels still in fossils. Now, I want to ask you, if the fossil was laid down 200 million years ago, would a blood vessel last that long? That's a tough blood vessel if it did. The blood vessel would rot away, wouldn't it? It would decay. How is it that you can find organic material still left in these fossils? It is because they were not laid down millions of years ago as we learned, as I learned in science class in, in public school. It is because they're only at most a few thousand years old. And that's why it still exists. That's why you can still draw genetic material from them. And this, I'm, I, I'm, there's other things I didn't put up. There's one place where they found like a sealed off bubbles and when they released the air, the air content from the earth that would have been ancient possibly before the flood, the oxygen concentration was so much higher, which would speak to what we believe the canopy effect would have been during the flood, um, uh, uh, before the flood, uh, so that there would have been a higher partial pressure of oxygen. I thoroughly believe there was a higher partial pressure to, uh, pressure of oxygen before the flood, which means you wouldn't need as big a set of lungs to get the same amount of oxygen, which would make it sense why the dinosaurs could be so huge with little tiny lungs and why they would not have survived after the flood. But the ark is also evidence. And you can see the ark. Uh, this is the Santa Maria, the Wyoming, the Titanic, the Queen Mary II, these steel ships. These are wood ships on this end, but you see the ark. Noah's ark was massive. Big ship, 300 cubits long by 50 wide and 30 high. A cubit is 17 and a half inches, like the, the length of a forearm um, in length. It was virtually impossible to capsize. It would have to be turned 90 degrees on its side in order to flip over. It was not designed to sail. It wasn't a cruise ship. It was designed that when the waters got rough and they rocked, the boat would not tip over and it would survive the deluge, and remember the water remained on the earth, the Bible says, for 150 days. They had to be able to stay in that boat for a long time. And I'm showing you this because it tells you God is a great God. He knew how to design the boat. And when you look at the size of the thing, it's massive. It's huge. And it was built with three uh, stories, as the scripture says, and it was made so that you could store a lot of things in it. Here's the internal volume, 1,518 uh, uh, 1,518,750 cubic feet, or the equivalent of 569 standard railroad boxcars. We got stuck behind a train the other day. You know how those boxcars go by? 
Imagine if 569 of them went by. You might as well get out and wash your car and go get something to eat and come back. That's how much space was in the ark, the way the Bible defines it. And I'm telling you this because you've got to understand you don't serve a God who just haphazardly does things. He is a God of intention. He made an ark so big that not just Noah and his family and his animals could have fit in it. If we took the time to do the math, the people that anyone who wanted to be saved, there was space for them. The world doesn't talk about that part. There was space for anyone who wanted to get into the ark and be saved along with Noah's family. It was designed to save many, many people. It could hold over 125,000 sheep, right? And here's the thing. Most animals are smaller than sheep. It could fit a lot of animals and still have plenty of space. And again, you you could take baby animals into the ark. They'd grow up and they'd reproduce and everything would be fine. So I will, I will say this, that someone was bold enough to actually, in this place, this is in Kentucky, it's called an Ark Encounter. Some of you have probably been there. I haven't been there yet. I have to get there. But it, this place, the, the venom online against this place. So Christians came together and built a replica of what the Ark would have looked like. It's in Kentucky. It's a massive thing. I've heard it's, it's, it's like, um, it's completely um, 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 infused the economy of whatever little local town was there. So many people go to see this thing, and you can go and walk around inside because it's, it's sometimes it helps you to see what God is. So they just took the description of what's in the Bible and built it, and they built it, and, they, and it, now you can go to Kentucky and look at it. And I'm not saying you need this to believe, but I am saying it makes it believable. Because here's the thing. If it was just a made-up story, somebody just making up a story really be able to design the thing just perfectly to do exactly what it needs to do? I don't think so. So what does the world do? The world comes back and it attacks. Here's some evidence of that. Here's the movie Noah. This is with um, Russell Crowe, one of Hollywood's most famous, most talented of all actors. And they made a horrible movie. I mean, they just basically disparaged the Lord our God. And, and let, me, let me throw this in there while we're talking about this. It's, this is important. We as Christians have to be careful what we expose ourselves to. And we really have to be careful what we expose our children to. Because sometimes our kids will grow up watching these movies, and then later on we wonder why they don't want to go to church. This one, the movie um, about Moses, I think it was uh, Egypt. uh, There was one, I forget who who starred as Moses in that one. But in one of these movies, they make God a little angry little boy. I mean, they do some Luciferian stuff to really make God look bad. And if you're exposed to this stuff and to the modern-day music, it will turn you against God. You can't play with those spirits all week and then want to be in the presence of the Holy Spirit on Sabbath. Another movie they did that with is this one. This is 2012. You look at the Buddhist monk. He's standing there safe. The waters rise. The statue of Jesus, which we don't believe in statues of Jesus, the statues of Jesus falls. You see the symbolism there? And in this movie, there's a scene, I forget the black actor's name. His name is difficult to pronounce. Um, He has a whole soliloquy, a whole speech at the end of the movie where he talks about how terrible it would be to not save everybody you could onto the ark. How could you leave everyone off? And really, it's a slap in the face of Jehovah God. But this is what Hollywood does. So it's not just that we go to school and we learn false science, or or as the scripture says, it's science falsely so-called. We then are entertained with ideas that the devil puts out to make sure you don't believe the word of God. So when we, we're going to transition over now to the spiritual ramifications. I didn't want, this was one where I could, we could get heavy into the science. I didn't want to do that. Just to give you a teaser to show you that yes, there was a flood, a global one, just as the Bible says. And because of that, what the Bible says, what Jesus particularly says about that flood is relevant to us today. Here's what Spirit of Prophecy says, Signs of the Times magazine, April 18, 1895. Here's what it says. Thus it was that the wise men of the world talked of science and the fixed laws of nature and declared that there could be no variation in these laws and that this message of Noah could not possibly be true. The talented men of Noah's time set themselves in league against God's will and purpose and scorned the message and the messenger that he had sent. When they could not move Noah from his firm and implicit trust in the word of God, they pointed to him as a fanatic, as a ranting old man, full of superstition and madness. 
just like people do to us today. Thus they condemned him because he would not be turned from his purpose by reasoning and theories of men. It was true that Noah could not controvert their philosophies or refute the claims of science so-called, but he could proclaim the word of God, for he knew it contained the infinite wisdom of the creator, and as he sounded it everywhere, it lost none of its force and reality because men of the world treated him with ridicule and contempt. Just because they ridicule you does not mean that the word of God does not stand strong. In fact, let me tell you something. If you are not ridiculed, if people do not come against you because of your beliefs, you're doing something wrong. What we believe goes against everything the world stands for. But while salvation is promised on condition of faith in God's son, condemnation is pronounced upon those that believe not. He that believes not the son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. God has indescribable love for the sinner, but he declares the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And here's the key. She says, God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, for it is his will that all men should have eternal life through faith in the Son of God. The spiritual ramifications are found here. That just as they were duped then to not believe what Noah was saying, and there's a lot more to the story, the time on the ark, the sending out of the birds, the, 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 the abating of the waters, the, all that happens. But the most important thing for us today is just as they came against Noah, they will come against us to try to make us not believe. And so Jesus speaks on this. That's how poor, important the story of Noah is. And if you're a Christian, how do you not believe that Jesus believed in the flood? Because there are Christians who don't believe the flood story. But here's what Jesus says, Matthew 24, 37. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. Here it is. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. This is a solemn prophetic warning from Christ that it's real important that we understand that the warning that was given then went unheeded and there's evidence that there was this great flood. Understand that the warning that is being given today must also be heeded. Here's what Peter says, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 3, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts. That's us today. Why do they scoff? You know what people really want? They just want to do what they want to do. Goes back to Alistair Crowley. Do as thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. They want to do whatever they want to do. They don't want the word of God in their lives. Walking after their own lust. So they mock and they scoff. Here's what they said then, and, and like they say now. And saying, where is the promise of his coming? The return of Christ. For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old. Peter reaffirms, God created the world and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Verse 6, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water. What did it do? It perished. Jesus confirms the flood. Peter confirms the flood. Here it is. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. <laughs> we used to sing a song for AY back in the day. Um, it's going to rain, it's going to rain, you better get ready because it's going to rain. Remember that song? And at, at the end of the song it said, it won't be water, but fire next time. My Bible says that this world is being reserved. Now here's what's deep. When you look at the flood story, the waters came up from below and from above. Peter is telling you that the fire that is beneath now will one day destroy this earth. It is reserved today. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Here's a key verse from Peter. I'm going to read a couple more, and then, but this is a key one. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. Why is God waiting that 180 years since the great disappointment? Here it is. God is long-suffering 
but is long suffering. What is he? He's patient. He's willing to suffer long with us. Wicked sinners who violate his law. Not willing that what? That any should perish. But that all should come to repentance. God is waiting for us. Not willing that any one of us should perish. There it is. Verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night into which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. God, he says he's going to come as a thief in the night. When people don't expect it, when we are caught up in the things of this world, worried about who's going to win the World Series, the Super Bowl or NBA championship, when we're so caught up in the next presidential election, some of us have more faith in these candidates than we do in Jesus, our Lord. Let me tell you, no matter who wins, they can't fix the world's problems. My hope is in Christ Jesus. Amen. Verse 11, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? I'm telling you, you look at all of, the, all of this world, and we were in Southern California recently, and people drive by you, and, we're in, and in Miami, drive by you in Bentleys and, and Maybachs and McLarens and Lamborghinis and Ferraris, and it's like the spirit has to whisper in your ear, all of it will one day burn up. The Super Bowl rings, the NBA championship rings, the Stanley Cup trophies, all of it will one day melt. So Peter says, if that's the case, what kind of people should we be? Verse 12, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Church, what are you holding on to? You see, because the way it really works, it's not that people, it, it, the way it really works, it's not the, the understanding of hell that many people get that, you know, hell is beneath the earth burning now. It's not. But if you hold on to the things of this earth, when they catch on fire, what's going to happen to you? If there's something on this earth so important to you that you won't let go of it, when it's time for it to melt, you're going to still be holding on to it. And I mean that physically and spiritually as well. Verse 13, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells what? Righteousness. Did you get that? This earth is going to be made over. The last time it just settled. And I, I wish I had time to explain. For, it took a long time for the world to recover from what the flood did to it. A long time. But when the earth is destroyed the next time, I want to be in the new Jerusalem. After the millennium, after the thousand years, I want to be sitting on the walls or looking over the walls or through the walls or however we see. But I'm going to be inside the city. And I want to watch as this earth is made over. We will have the opportunity to see earth created again. What a privilege. Verse 14, wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace. What are we supposed to be? Diligent. That means we should, we're supposed to be consistent and intentional that you may be found in him, of him in peace. Look at how God is looking to find us without spot and blameless. There's a lot of people teaching uh, this. The, 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 I've been talking about this love reality doctrine that's going around in our church. God loves you too much to destroy you. This is his love reality. You can do whatever you want. It's not what the Bible teaches. It teaches that we are to develop the character of Christ. How do you develop it? This is what the trials we go through in life are for. They allow us to be developed into knowing him better. This is why life on earth is not easy always for the Christian. We are like gold tried in the fire, uh, Revelation chapter 3 tells us. As we go through the fire, we're purified. The base metal of our character is burned off and we change. We are supposed to be like him. This is why the scripture says, to have in you this mind that was also in Christ Jesus. The beautiful thing about it is, he says, I'll do the work. It is the love of Christ that constrains us. 
So how do you do it? You've got to learn to walk with God like Noah did, like Enoch did. How do you walk with someone and actually become like them? By listening to them. By having a prayer life, by having a, 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 a worship life in your home, by studying the scripture so that your character slowly but surely, the things you used to like to do, you say, hey, I'm not, I don't need to do that anymore. Slowly but surely, you begin to change from your old self to a new one through the process of sanctification as God works in your life. Verse 15, an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. It's the fact that he's waiting for us that allows us to be saved. He's patient with us. And, and let, me, let me pause and say this to somebody who thinks that somehow they have lived such a life of sin that God would never ex accept them. I, I, I talk about this all the time. It's important. Whatever you've done, you have not out God's ability to save you. I don't care how far in the world you went. I don't care how many nights you've spent in a no-tell motel. I don't care how high you were before. I don't care how, what, what organization you were involved with that was not of God. I, I, I don't even know how to explain it all the way. I can only tell you that he's long-suffering. He's not willing that any should perish. And I came to tell you today that like Noah walked with God, and his righteousness was by faith. No matter how bad you think you've been, the blood of Christ is better. It is more powerful. It still washes. It still cleanses. And let me tell you something. Some of you need to know this. He's going, the devil no sees the potential in some of you sitting right here right now. He's going to work to destroy your marriage. He's going to work to, to corrupt your children. He's going to try and put enmity in your house. He's going to try and put doubt in your mind. I want you right now to rebuke the devil out of your house, out of your mind, out of your children, out of your life. I want you to learn to call on the name of the Lord in faith. Amen. Last couple of slides are from Signs of the Times, April 18, 1895. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. But it is a part of the gospel to warn the sinner of, their, of the doom that awaits the unbelieving and unrepentant soul. The love of God has been manifested in the gift of his dear son to the world, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But while salvation is promised on condition of faith in God's son, condemnation is pronounced upon those who believe not. He that believes not the son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. God has indescribable love for the sinner, but he declares the soul that sinneth, it shall die. God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, for it is his will that all men should have eternal life through the faith in the Son of God. The long-suffering God bore with the inhabitants of the old world 120 years, but his patience, his long forbearance was made an excuse for indifference and impenitence of an abuse of his providences. No soul is ever deserted of God. I'm going to read that again. No soul is ever deserted of God, given up to his own way and doings, for doings, forsaken of heaven, as long as there is the least hope of his salvation. God follows men with entreaties, with warnings of danger, with assurance of compassion, until it is sure that further opportunities and privileges would be wholly in vain. And at that point, you have grieved the Holy Spirit. I, I like what, 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 what Sister White says here. With warnings of danger, with assurances of compassion. He's compassionate. And I've learned, although I don't deserve his love, he gives it to me freely. Yeah. Noah's light was to shine forth for 120 years amid the moral darkness of people who were encompassed within a certain limit of years. Under Noah's direction, his carpenters built an ark, and they were impressed day by day by the unwavering faith, the unswerving integrity of the messenger of God. Every blow of the hammer, every advance that was made was a warning to the world of the flood that swept away the unbelieving and ungodly. Noah's faith was a working faith. It was a saving faith that moved him with fear and led him to act in accordance with the word of God. Here's how she finishes that. This is the quality of faith that will save the soul. Is it yours? Is that your faith? 
Will you bang the hammer of the work of the gospel? Will you live a life that shows the world that you're serious about your relationship with Jesus Christ? Regardless of, 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 of rejection or ridicule, will you stand for, firm in Jesus Christ? Or will you make excuses that you have more time? Will you make excuses that you've lived too foul? Will you make excuses that you can't get right? I challenge you today that the God who designed the ark, the God who will remake the earth, can remake us. And I challenge you to submit to him, to call on him, I just want to make this appeal. I'm going to ask Jackie to just come and sing a song. You want to be serious about it. As we go into the fall and into this winter season, you want to rededicate your life to him. You want to be like Noah. You want to have a relationship where you walk with God. Some of us have been walking with the world. Time to let go of the world's hand now. And grab onto God's hand and start working with, walking with him. As the song is sung, if that's your, your hope that you get that walk with God, I just want you to stand and then we'll close. Father God, there are some here really, who really are going through some things. There are marriages that aren't, they're not jiving because the devil is all up in the house. There are parents who are grieving over their children. Not because they've lost them, but because, Lord, they are lost to you right now. Mm. There are others here, Lord, who are struggling financially. Some of losing hope, weighed down with doubt. There are young people here who don't see a clear future in front of them. Today, Lord, I ask that we would all collectively turn our eyes to Jesus. That we would look full into your wonderful face. So that the things of earth would grow strangely dim in the light of your glory and grace. Lord, I am praying for that married couple right now. That Lord, the love of Christ would shine in that house. I rebuke the devil out of all of our marriages, Lord. I pray, Lord, for our children. Lord, you promise us in Isaiah 49 and verse uh, 25, Lord, you say you give us the promise that you will save our children. Lord, I'm praying right now that our children would be saved despite the contamination of this world. Lord, I pray right now, Lord, in a special way uh, for all of our, our, our teenagers and young adults. Never in earth's history has it been so difficult to be young in terms of spiritual things, Lord. And I pray that their eyes would stay fixed on Christ Jesus. That person who needs a job, that person, Lord, who needs healing, Lord, let them not, le let them not leave this place thinking that you're not able. Show them, Lord, that you're, you follow them with compassion. And Father God, most importantly, help us to be ready when you come. Let us not be like the antediluvian world that heard the hammers, saw the animals walk into the ark, saw the door sealed, and still were not convinced. Father God, let us believe you now so that we are safely in the ark in these last days. This is our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Let the church say amen, amen. and amen. You may be seated.